Now, uh, since we're, you know, we're doing different topics through this, uh, through this book, uh, it would uh, help us to keep an eye on you know, the big picture, because there's a big picture in this book. There's an overarching theme in this book. In order to properly understand all the individual pieces that we're kind of putting together, and sometimes we lose track of that uh, when we do a study from week to week. If we, if we could study this book, you know, uh, uh, there was a class every single day and we, you know, we did it 13 days in a row, we'd always keep that in mind, but since we, you know, we, we have a class a week, it's easy to forget what, what the original idea was. Uh, this epistle, this letter, is one of instruction to a dynamic church, a very dynamic church, but a dynamic church that has dynamic problems. Dynamic problems. And among these problems are, first of all, they are a first generation Christian church. In other words, the, all the Christians in this congregation are first generation. Uh, they have come out, most of them have come out of the worst pagan society and, uh, and practices. We uh, here, you know, uh, if I look around, I see people who are able to say, well, my, my father was a a member of the church and my grandfather was a member of the church and my uncle was a preacher and my cousin's an elder. You know, there's a lot of people here have a long history uh, with Christianity, but not these people. The people that Paul is writing to here in 1 Corinthians, they were the first generation. Their dads and their moms and so on and so forth were not, were not Christians. They came out of some of the worst pagan practices imaginable and many of them were bringing in a lot of their attitudes uh, and misconceptions into the church, into their practice of Christianity. That's nothing new. You know, I remember a, a, a person in Montreal when I was working there who when he, he came out of Hinduism uh, and um, uh, when he would go up and serve communion, he would take his shoes off because in his background and his training and his religious thinking, removing your shoes when you did something that was holy was required. He would take off his shoes. Whenever we'd ask him to preside at the table, he'd go up there and take off his shoes. Well, you know, we're not going to you know, break his arm over a thing like that. It was just a, a cultural religious thing that just stayed with him. It's just hard for him to, to imagine you know, that he, he could come to God with a faithful heart and not have to go through that type of, of ritual. Now I said that they, they were a dynamic church um, in the sense that they possessed incredible spiritual gifts. Some of the individuals in that congregation could uh, heal, uh, they could perform miraculous uh, healings. Uh, today, you know, if somebody can, well, claims that they can heal, they have a big tent meeting, there's 10,000 people and there's TVs and they pass the hat and they raise a million bucks, you know, because uh, one person claims to have, this, uh, to have this ability. But in the Corinthian church, they weren't superstars, you know, lots of members could heal. Lots of them had that ability. Imagine a congregation where several members have the ability to heal. And others had the ability to speak in tongues. In other words, speak a language that they hadn't learned before. And we'll talk about that a little bit later on, but that was a, a tremendous miracle. And still others could prophesy and others had inspired wisdom, inspired knowledge, very dynamic church. So they had great potential as a congregation. However, they were constantly fighting for preeminence and for position and power. And to make things worse, they were using their spiritual gifts in the service of pursuing power and position in the church. So it was a very unique situation, a very dynamic situation. So in answer to these problems, Paul encourages them to cultivate the character of Christ-like love. We talked about that last week. In order to neutralize their pride and to promote harmony and peace among the group. Notice he doesn't say, I'm going to take away your gifts. He doesn't say, I'm going to take away your gifts. He, he doesn't tell them what not to do. He tells them what they need to do in order to, 
in order to find their emotional and spiritual balance. And in finding that there would be peace and there would be the environment where they could use these gifts in a productive way. So in chapter 14, he provides them with more practical direction on the proper use and the purpose for the gifts that they have received. And that includes the gift of prophecy or the gift today we'd call that the gift of preaching. So before we go through the actual passage itself, I think it would be helpful if we understood some of the terms that he uses, because he doesn't explain the terms. He is assuming that his readers know exactly what he's talking about, but 2,000 years removed, you know, we need to understand exactly what the terms uh, that he uses actually meant at that time. You know, in, in modern times, these terms have been appropriated by different groups to mean something different than they actually meant at the time when Paul, uh, when Paul used them. So let's go over some of these. Uh, he uses the term prophecy. Prophecy, the word prophecy comes from two words which meant to speak and forth. So taking two words, to speak, to speak forth. In biblical context, it was the speaking forth of the mind of God. That was, that was the gift of, of prophecy. Now we know that throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, prophets not only predicted future events, but they also spoke forth the mind of God about the past, about what was happening right now, and also about what was going to happen in the future. Now during biblical times, both Old and New Testaments, the prophets, as we call them, spoke directly from God as the Holy Spirit gave them utterance. So you can stay in 1 Corinthians 14 and just flip over to 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 21, where the apostle himself, or Peter the apostle, explains what this gift of prophecy actually meant for that time. He says, for no prophecy, no speaking forth, okay. he says, for no prophecy was ever made by an act of human will, but men moved by the Holy Spirit spoke from God. Peter is saying prophecy is not, doesn't come from man. An individual doesn't say, well, I think today I'm going to prophesy. I think, well, around church is at 11 o'clock. I think you know, when I get to church and when the, when the Christians meet, I believe that I will, I will make a prophecy. He says it doesn't come from the human mind. It doesn't come from the human will. But rather, he says, men spoke through the power of the Holy Spirit. And in the Greek, the, the, the word that he uses there is the same as, um, imagine a sailboat and the wind catching the sail and directing the, the boat. So he's, he's making this analogy. God is the wind, we're the boat, or the prophets were the boat, and God is the one that directed what would be said and what would be, what would be spoken. So as the Bible was collected and written down into one document, this miraculous ability ceased and was carried out in a natural way by preachers and teachers who used the actual revelation of God that was recorded in the Bible. So at the beginning, God needed to speak to His church, but all the instructions that He wanted to give were not yet written, were not yet documented. And so many times in churches, He spoke through prophets, through individuals who had this particular gift. And we know from history that with time, many of these writings of the apostles mainly were recorded and collected. I mean, they circulated as individual letters for a time or a group of letters from church to church. But by the fourth century, all of what we have now in the New Testament had been collected and put together and confirmed as the inspired word of God. And when we have all of the, and the Old Testament, 400 years before Christ, the Old Testament, the canon of the Old Testament, or the, the group of official books, if you wish, of the Old Testament, had already been collected. So by the third to fourth century, the Bible that we have today is the Bible that was in existence at that time. And so we had the full revelation of God in the Bible. The church did not need men, women, who had this gift of being able to speak directly from God. Now everyone had access to what God had to say in His word, uh, which we have in the Bible. So the difference is that 
whereas the message of the prophet was a direct revelation of the mind of God for that occasion. The message of the preacher or the teacher today is gathered from the completed revelation com compiled in the Bible. Same result, the preacher or the teacher is speaking forth the word of God. The difference is everyone in the audience has the same word of God. Everyone listening can confirm and affirm the idea that whoever is preaching or teaching is actually speaking from the word of God because we all are reading uh, God's word. All right, another word that he uses is tongues. Uh, this word again comes from the Greek word which means a tongue, just the, 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 the human tongue. And it has several uses in the Bible, but it depends on the context. So the same word, we have that in English too, don't we? You know, one word will mean something different depending on the context. Same thing with the idea of tongues. So it can mean a physical organ of speech, the tongue. Watch your tongue, you know, the physical organ of speech. Or it can mean a language. When you add other endings to this word in the Greek, you get the Greek word for tribe, or people, or nation. Okay? So in the Bible it says you know, we need to bring the gospel to every nation or every tribe. Well, it's this word here with a, a different ending. And then the meaning of this word in the chapter that we're about to study in 1 Corinthians 14 refers to the supernatural ability to speak in a language that you have never learned before. For example, if this very moment I began speaking to you in Mandarin, you know, Chinese, and I have absolutely no background in that language. I've never studied it. I've never, you know, I may have heard somebody speak it, but I began speaking perfectly in that language. That would be a miracle, wouldn't it? There's no human way that I could do that. That's the, that's the miracle that is described in the Bible. Now, today, in, in the charismatic movements of various sorts, People refer to tongues as this kind of non-language that people say during public assemblies or in, or in private. And they refer to that as tongues. And they say, well, you know, of course you don't understand it. You know? It's the language of angels. That's usually the, uh, that's usually the uh, argument that in charismatic movements. You know, we're speaking the language of angels. But we need to point out that every time you hear an angel speak, in the Bible, they always speak a language known to man, never a language that is unknown to, to anyone. The other thing is the word itself refers to a human, that's what it means, a human language. All right, and then we'll, we'll look at this a little more as we cover the text. The next word is revelation. The word revelation means or refers to something that man cannot know through reasoning or study alone. Information only obtainable if God gives it to you. That's revelation. Something that happens in the future. For example, uh, Jeremiah uh, uh, talking about the 70 years of captivity that the, uh, that the Jews were about to uh, suffer, something that happens in the future. How could he know that? It was a revelation. So we have revelation in the Bible that tells us who Jesus was and why he came, so on and so forth. Revelation. And then another term, as it is, uh, is the term interpretation, as it is used in 1 Corinthians 14. Um, interpretation is the ability to understand a language that you have never learned. So speaking in tongues is the ability to speak a language that you have never learned, and interpretation is the ability to understand a language that you have never learned. It seems that some, we're talking about you know, in the Corinthian church, it seems that some of them could only speak unknown languages. In other words, they could speak in tongue, and some could only understand unknown languages, interpretation. In other words, I could speak Chinese, and I know it's Chinese because I know what Chinese sounds like, but I didn't understand what I was saying. 
and then somebody else in the audience who couldn't speak Chinese but understood what was being said and could say it in English. So the gifts apparently only worked if there was cooperation between God and the Corinthians and the Corinthians with each other. All right, so let's go to chapter 14, 1 Corinthians. Take a look at the, a few verses there that talks about the purpose of preaching. Now this is a long chapter, but Paul lays out his case in the first four verses, and then the rest of the chapter is simply an explanation of the details and the um, application of what he says in the first four chapters. So chapter 14, beginning in verse one, he says, Pursue love, yet desire earnestly spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. Now he doesn't want to dampen their enthusiasm for spiritual gifts, even though they're misusing them. But he does want them to get some perspective on their purpose and their value. So he says, in the hierarchy of gifts, tongues and miracles and healings and interpretations and knowledge and wisdom and pro you know, in the hierarchy of gifts, he places prophecy at the very top as the most useful and valuable of all the gifts. Imagine, imagine, Paul is saying, you got a guy there who, you know, who can uh, heal miraculously and you got this other guy there who has the ability to speak forth the word of God. This guy here is more valuable than that guy in the, in the scheme of things. The ability to proclaim and explain God's word, he says, this is, the, this is at the top tier. Now, in the next three verses, he's going to explain why this is so. Why is prophecy the, 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 the most valuable of, they're all valuable, but why is prophecy the most valuable gift? And so in verse two he says, for one who speaks in a tongue does not speak to men, but to God for no one understands, but in his spirit he speaks mysteries. So one who has the gift of tongues does not understand what he is saying. It's a mystery, I can't understand, I'm speaking Chinese, I know it's Chinese, but I don't know what I'm saying. Nor does anyone else, unless there is someone to interpret. So the only one who knows what is being said is God. Why? Because God understands all languages. He invented, he created languages. For example, as I said, if I broke out into Chinese all of a sudden and I was reciting Psalm 23, I would be amazed and so would you, but no one would understand what I'd be saying except God and if there were any Chinese people here. They'd be the only ones edified. So he goes on to say in verse three, but one who prophesies, prophecies speaks to men for edification and exhortation and consolation. So now he talks about the one who can speak forth, the one who prophesies. He says that one who speaks to men in their own language and preaches or teaches God's word so all could understand, that person accomplishes the very purpose God intended his word to have and the utterance of it to have. And so the preaching and the prophesying of God's word in a miraculous or natural way promotes certain things. So he mentions three. Number one, edification. The speaking forth of God's word so the church can understand it produces edification. Again, in the Greek, because the Bible's written in Greek, so they have a more descriptive, you know, a more descriptive language of these words. Edification literally means to build a house to build a house or a home. And it's used in the New Testament to describe the building or the promotion of spiritual growth in other people. And this is done, he says, by example or teaching or providing strength to those who are weak. So if I speak Chinese, you're amazed that I can do that thing, but are you edified? No, unless you understand Chinese. He says that the speaking forth of God's word is uh, profitable for exhortation. We don't use that word anymore. It's, a, it's an English word, but it's an old fashioned word. It means to call to one side, call someone to one side. 
basically to call or to urge others to a proper course of conduct. It means, you know, visually it means you call somebody to your side and you, you walk with them and direct them in the, in the right way. You know, like a child, you know, they're running around, you know, you're saying goodbye and they're running around and it's time to go and they're running near the street or something, hey, come back, come back here, come, take daddy's hand or take grandpa's hand, you know, and you, you walk with them in the right, in the right way. Always with the intention of betterment and with the eye to the future. You know, when we say press on to, uh, to maturity, when the preacher says let's press on to maturity, he's making an exhortation, calling to one side that we can go forward together. And then he says speaking forth also produces consolation. Comes from the same word as exhortation, but it has a different purpose in this context. Consolation means to come alongside with, with a greater degree of tenderness. Some translators use the word comfort to express the idea, and this word really does describe this action. It's the same word to refer to the Holy Spirit, you know, the comforter will come. So along with declaring the good news of the gospel in as many ways as possible, the purpose of preaching and teaching, especially pulpit preaching, for example, is well summarized in this one verse. So what is the purpose of modern preaching? What is the purpose of speaking forth in the modern day? You know, the idea of Bible study is you, you study what the Bible says and figure out what did it mean to the people it was spoken to at that time. That's like building the ground floor. It's building the, you know, the foundation of the text. What did it mean to the people who were hearing it for the first time in the first century? That's why we often say, well, the Greek means this and the context means that, because we're trying to go back and figure out how did those first century people understand what he was saying? And once we have that basis, then we move forward and we try to apply it to our time today. So what does it mean today? Modern preaching, what is its purpose? Well, the very same thing. To, to build up the church by teaching it the whole counsel of God and setting in order the things that are not orderly or that are not functioning in a biblical fashion. How do you do that? Well, it happens through preaching and teaching, through the organization of various ministries, through managing various projects. To do what? To build up the New Testament church. Same work. Same basic tool, just different context. What other purpose does modern preaching have? Well, to encourage, to exhort the church as a group and as individuals to do the right thing. You know, the hardest part of church work is to encourage people to do the right thing because people do not like to be told what they should do. People don't like their sins pointed out to them. Nobody does, even the, the preacher doesn't like it. No, nobody likes it. No one likes to have their weaknesses exposed. And I can tell you that more preachers crash right at this point here. They crash at exhortation, at the exhortation part of their sermon, because in doing this part of their work, they invoke the anger and the resentment of people in the church, and some opt for revenge instead of re repentance. I, I remember uh, when I was uh, working in Montreal a long time ago, and uh, I was preaching, and you know, I don't know, but I don't know if you realize this, but when the preacher's preaching, you see him. You know, you see him, you're, you're looking at him, well most of the time, unless you're checking your text messages or your Facebook account, but usually you're paying attention to the, to the preacher up front, you're looking at him, but you have to realize he's looking at you too. He's seeing that you're checking your text messages, he sees that you're talking to the guy next to you, he sees that you're nodding off asleep, you know, he sees you. And I remember, I remember in Montreal when, when I'd be preaching about something, I don't know, whatever, you know, whatever topic or something, and there was a lady there, she was like my barometer, you know, I, I could tell the temperature by her. And if I said something that she didn't like, she'd, she'd sit there and she'd go. <laughs> and, I, and I would know, uh-oh, I'm in trouble. <laughs> 
And I know that after the sermon was over, you know, and after the service was over, and I'd be outside greeting folks on their way out, boy, so here she comes, she's going to tell me. I knew it, she was telegraphing ahead of time. I didn't like what you said. Sometimes people say things like, well, you really stepped on my toes today. That means, oh, you were, you were talking to me. Sometimes people actually say, you really talked to me today. My name was on that sermon. And most people I know, I've never heard of anyone writing a sermon or a lesson directed at a single, at like only one person in the audience. That's just a waste of time. You have 100, 300, 500 in the audience. Your goal as a preacher is to edify the whole. But you know, things being what they are, sometimes some lessons hit home with people more than, more than others. And then of course, sometimes preachers who don't have a lot of experience uh, don't know how much, you know, how much gunpowder to put in the thing, you know, and they blow themselves up <laughs> with, the, with, their, with their lessons as well. I remember a, a young guy once who uh, wanted to uh, demonstrate how people, um, uh, how people treated the Bible, how they kind of cherry picked in the Bible. Oh, going to heaven, oh, I like that part, I'll keep that part. Oh, thou shalt not lie, I don't like that part. You know, and they ignore that, you know, you've heard lessons like that. So he wanted to bring this idea home. And what he did was he said, you know, he turned to a passage and read it and they say, well, that's nice, you know, God forgives sin, God, I like that. And then he'd go to Exodus 20, thou shalt not commit adultery, I don't like. And then he would rip the page of the Bible and, and crumple it up and throw it on the ground you know, as, a, as an object lesson. You know? And the elders fired him that afternoon. So that was not a, that was not a good thing to, uh, to tear up the Bible in, 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 in a public as an object lesson. But anyways, uh, different people do different things to bring home their, their point in exhortation. Uh, and also today, uh, the idea is to comfort. To comfort and encourage those who are weak because of spiritual immaturity or because of physical limitations. Um, there's nothing in the Bible that says that preachers have to do weddings. Absolutely nothing in the Bible that even suggests that ministers have to officiate at weddings. Actually, it's a Catholic idea. It started with the Catholic Church. But you know, it's our tradition to have a minister there. Why? Because we want a prayer offered. We want to add a spiritual dimension, a spiritual comfort to what we're doing or ministers to be at funerals. Again, there's nothing there that, nothing in the Bible that says a minister has to officiate at a funeral, but we usually want someone there. Why? Because we need the comfort of God's word. We want the comfort of the prayers and encouragement from a spiritual perspective. And of course, comfort in the sense uh, that the teacher will bring lessons that remind us of God's mercy and God's strength and God's, God's goodness. So, Paul reminds these people that these are the kinds of things that people need in the church and the ability to prophecy was the gift that provided these type of things for the congregation. Fellowship is good. You know, we have our coffee bar in the morning. Fellowship is great to talk to one another, but to comfort the soul, to exhort the soul, to teach the soul about Christ, that's the duty of preaching. That's the gift of speaking forth. That's what God has given to the church to accomplish those those things. So today we don't prophecy from direct revelation about the past or the present or the future. Today, because we have God's word, we prophecy about the past and the present and the future so far as it has been recorded, so far as we know it from God's written word. For example, I know the past from the Bible perspective and I can use it to instruct the church. You know, Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 11, that uh, these things were written, you know, these things, meaning things in the past, were written for our instruction today. So that's why Marty, for example, or myself, will bring a lesson from the Old Testament. Are we under the Old Testament? Well, of course not. But the Old Testament provides amazing lessons for us in God's relationship with man. As a matter of fact, the Old Testament is a marvelous book or a marvelous set of books that helps us understand God's relationship with, with people. Um, I, I can also comment on our present situation using the word as my guide uh, for Christian living. Paul says, 2 Timothy 3.16, every scripture is inspired by God and profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for exhortation, right? So I know the present situation of the church 
and, and use the Bible to address present, present day problems. As a matter of fact, it's one of the biggest challenges that all ministers have. What am I going to preach about today? And I know some ministers, for example, uh, they have a sabbatical, they take a sabbatical, maybe two weeks off or two or three weeks and they go to the woods or somewhere and uh, they plan out lessons for 52 weeks, a 52 week program of sermons. And I mean, that's one way of, of doing it. I personally do not ascribe to that because things change. Remember when the, the, the Murrah building bombing that took place many years ago here in Oklahoma City? That happened on a Wednesday. I remember that, it happened on a Wednesday. And on that Wednesday night, my auditorium class, I was prepared to talk about the Levitical priesthood. Good subject, you know, Levitical priesthood, fascinating subject, important subject, helps us to understand you know, Christ and His coming and all that stuff. I had you know, pictures, handouts, the whole thing, I was ready. Do you think anybody was ready to listen to a lesson about the Levitical priesthood on that Wednesday night after the Murrow building had been blown up that morning? Absolutely not. I had to change, you know, because um, technically the task was to go from an instructive lesson about the Bible to a lesson on comfort, a message of comfort, a message of hope. Why? Because that's what the church needed at the time. And so the gift of preaching, the ability to preach and speak forth the word of God has to take into account what's going on in the church. Has someone passed away? Someone you know, that we've known and loved? Are, are there a lot of marital problems going on in the church? All these things have to be kind of brought together to uh, think about uh, what type of sermons and lessons uh, that the preacher will address from week to week. And then I can look into the future, knowing what will happen at the end of the world and how to prepare for that now. What does Paul tell us in 1 Thessalonians chapter four, right? that Christ will come with a shout and the dead in Christ will rise. So I know what the future is bringing. I don't know when, but I know it's coming. And so like the prophets of old who had the gift of prophecy for you know, prophesying the events, I can't do that, Marty, preachers can't do that, but we do know the important event in the future that is coming for which we need to prepare today. So prophecy or preaching remains one of the most important ministries because through it the church continues to be built up, to be motivated and comforted in times of trouble. You know, it's unfortunate, I've, I've been doing this for a while. Um, uh, this is, uh, as a matter of fact, last Sunday was my 32nd year in ministry. First Sunday in November. Uh, in 1979 is when I was commended, if you wish, into the service of preaching by the church in Montreal. 32 years, and, and in that time I've worked for a lot of different churches and I've, I've you know, ministered in different places. And I've realized that many times churches, they take their preachers for granted until they don't have them anymore. And we are blessed in our congregation, we have two, not one, but two. Do you realize that the majority of the churches of Christ in our brotherhood have only one minister. 80% of all churches of Christ, anywhere you go, really only have one minister. To have two is the exception. To have more than two is really in the minority. And um, if you look at the Christian Chronicle, or if you go online, you can see how many churches are looking for preachers. Because, unfortunately, uh, many young men today would rather go into underwriting or you know, Wall Street business, banking, engineering, they want to do those things. They want to, you know, they're not listening perhaps to the call of their, their vocation. Well, in the next lesson on this passage, we're going to take the time to look at how Paul teaches these people to use their gifts and how each of them complemented each other in the working out of God's plan for the growth of the church. Not enough just to describe the gift. We need to understand how did they use them? How did all these gifts mesh together. In the meantime, let's focus uh, on a couple of important lessons that are contained in, in the, just a the short passage that we've, we've looked at today. Lesson number one, pursue love. To pursue means to eagerly follow after or chase after love. 
Now you know in the Bible there are all kinds of terms that refer to love. Eros, meaning physical or sexual love, or even the love of art or music. You know, people say, oh, I love Beethoven, or I love jazz, or whatever. I love art, I'm giving my life to art. That's Eros. It's not negative, it's, it's a normal human thing, but the Greeks used the word Eros to describe that kind of love. Storgios, another Greek word for love, meant actually like a house, family love. Mom and dad love, I love my grandpa, you know, that's Storgios. Uh, philios, brotherly love, Philadelphia, Philios. Brotherly love, uh, philanthropy, you know, giving to the poor, or building hospitals in you know, places that don't have hospitals. That, what kind of love is that? Philios. But when, the, when Paul is talking about pursue love in 14 verse one, the word there is agape, agapeo. Uh, a special word, the, the, the word originally meant in the Greek, it was a very little known and little used word in the Greek, it meant the kind of love that a grandparent has for his grandchild. This all-encompassing, forgiving type of love, you know, there's just nothing like grandma's love for her grandchild or grandpa's love for his grandchild. Well, they had a Greek word for that, agape. And so the New Testament writers selected that word to describe the kind of love that God had for us and the kind of love that we should have for one another. It's a sacrificial, all-encompassing love. It's not sexual, it's not necessarily mom and dad type of thing, it's not filial, you know, it's, it's agape. So Paul is saying we need to pursue that kind of love. Don't just wait for love to happen to you. You need to go after it. You need to build it. You need to care for it. You need to find how to establish and reestablish it when it's broken. In the church, you know, we strive to reach high ideals. We expect a lot from each other and so it's easy to be disappointed when people let us down. The worst disappointments I've ever had were from brethren. I expect the people in the world who do not know Christ, I expect them to let me down. But in the church, you know, I'm, I'm anticipating more from you and you're anticipating more from me. So for these reasons, we need to be proactive in our effort to create a loving attitude with others and willing to reestablish love with those from whom we are separated. And then another lesson, I need to shut it down here, desire earnestly spiritual gifts. Paul has just said that some gifts would end, you know, inspired prophecy and tongues and so on and so forth, but not all gifts are gone. In Romans chapter 12, verses six to eight, he names gifts and talents that still function in the church today. Prophecy, for example, the ability to preach. Service, uh, ministry in its various forms. Teaching, the opportunity and ability to teach other. Exhortation, those who encourage. These are all spiritual gifts, but they're given naturally. He talks about, again in Romans 12, about giving, the, the ability to give generously, leadership, uh, those who show mercy. These are all gifts given by the Spirit. They're all spiritual gifts in the church, necessary in the church. However, they're not supernatural, like healing or you know, prophecy for telling the future. So all of the gifts that I've just talked, giving, leadership, prophecy, so on and so forth, they're all gifts that God gives that enable us to exercise our ministry in the church for the growth of the kingdom. Paul said we need to desire these kinds of things. And then the third, the third point that I want to make today as we close out, remember that whoever preaches in this place, doesn't matter who it is, the purpose of preaching is to make the church grow. You know, preaching wasn't invented by man, it was invented by God. It's God's way of ministering to the church. So preachers are simply vessels of clay, as Paul says, who hold for a few moments the precious word of God. The overriding emotion that I have as I do this work is that of unworthiness. And this idea, I will tell you, is shared by most preachers. You get most preachers to sit down and talk to each other and really get serious about how they feel about their work, and many of them feel, well, I'm not, I don't know why God picked me to do this. You know, I'm, I'm a sinner. I, you know, I'm not really worthy to do this, but I'm doing the best I can. That's usually the feeling that preachers have. So me, Mike, as a preacher, I have succeeded if I have accurately and lovingly preached 
Only God's word. That's always my prayer as I prepare my lessons. Please, Lord, let me just, just say exactly as accurately as I can what you've said. Help me not to go to the left or right. Help me not to make a mistake. Make sure that it's accurate. And on the other end of it, you are receiving it properly if you respond to the word of God, not to me, but to the word of God in obedience and joy, in comfort. If you're comforted and encouraged, if you're built up, then the purpose of the teaching, whoever's doing it, has succeeded. And only in this way is God glorified and the church edified and the preaching justified. The preaching is justified if the church is growing and being edified because of it. Okay, so that's a, a beginning, of course, a, an introductory idea to a chapter 14. Next week we're going to get into the nuts and bolts of, okay, how did they use these kind of gifts, you know, teaching and healing and so on and so forth. How did they use them back in the first century? But that's it for now. Thank you for your attention.